competition is at the heart of American democracy. Two or more parties are supposed to go head to head before the public to hold each other accountable. But over the past few decades, that respectful exchange of ideas has been harder to come by, exacerbated by the likes of Donald Trump, who has not only stoked partisan animosity, but notoriously embraced an entirely different set of so-called alternative facts for his supporters. Thanks to that Trumpification of the GOP, the strong rise of progressive movements, a whole lot of gerrymandering and a few other factors, the two major U.S. parties are moving further from the center every minute and partisan balance back in the states is disappearing. That includes here in Massachusetts, one of only 12 states where one party controls the legislature and the other the corner office. I'll do the math for you. That means in the other 38, there's one party in control of all of it. And as Kara Vogt writes this week in The Atlantic, the decision by Charlie Baker, one of America's most popular governors and a moderate, not to run for re-election in a heavily Democratic state, quote, is a dark omen for the future of America's two-party system. Joining me to discuss are Jennifer Nassour, former chair of the Massachusetts Republican Party and founder and president of the Pocketbook Project, and Steve Kurgan, former CEO of the Democratic National Convention and president of Barack Obama's inaugural committee. Long time. It's great to see you both. Thanks for being here. Of course, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Jennifer, the thesis of this piece in The Atlantic is that Trumpers in the Republican Party in Massachusetts drove Charlie Baker out of the governorship, at least drove his decision not to run. Your face suggests you don't buy it. Uh, no, I don't buy it at all. I, it, listen, Charlie Baker has been governor for seven years now, and at some point, it's time to you know go on, move on, and do something else. He started with Snowmageddon, where we had snow storms almost every single day, and, and he's ending now in his time as being governor through an, a pandemic, a worldwide pandemic that has taken Massachusetts two years to move out of. So I would say at this point, he's probably exhausted, his family is exhausted, and he's still young enough to go on and have another chapter in his career. But Jennifer, even if everything you say is true, what's also true is in a poll at the end of last year, three quarters of Republicans in your party in Massachusetts said they were loyal to Trump. 68% of Republicans in this state said that Joe Biden was not the legitimate president of the United States. Could Charlie Baker have even won a primary in that party? Absolutely. Charlie Baker would not only win a primary, but he would win the governor's office again. So, I mean, look, a poll is a poll. And who's answering those polls? Because I don't know about you, but I don't have enough time to answer those polls. I don't know if Steve has enough time to he answer does. those He does. Steve polls. does. He has plenty of time. <laughs> he has plenty of Thanks, time. Thanks, <laughs> I think what we see with polls is that, you know, they're good for those who answer them. But for everyone else, when you look at Baker's record, and when you look at not only Baker's record, but if you look at the record of all of the Republican governors that have served in Massachusetts, yeah. they have all been amazing fiscal managers. We have had the economy on track and businesses okay, going. Okay, fair on. enough. Steve, so, I got to right, go to Steve. <laughs> Are you buying this notion that Charlie Baker, I happen to agree with uh, Jennifer, I should say, but the numbers suggest that he couldn't have won a primary. Could he? Yeah, I tend to, I, it, as much as it pains me, uh, I at least uh, tend to agree with part of what Jen uh, said. What part? Which is, I, I, I think he probably could have won his his primary. It would have been a lot harder. I mean, they're in, they are, um, uh, they're in such disarray over at the state Republican Party that uh, who knows what could have happened there with their state convention and all that. Um, but I think he would have been able to find a way to uh, to eke out the nomination. I do not think if uh, Maura Healy had been on the ballot against him uh, that it would have been a lead pipe cinch that he'd get a third term. Uh, but it would have been a fun campaign to watch. Well, but th I think the reality, Steve, staying with you, is the polls suggest, and I think reality suggests, may change by the fall, is that with Baker out of the race, it's much more likely that this does become a one-party state, like suggested in the Atlantic. It would be a one-party democratic state. Does that trouble you at all in terms of small D democracy? Not the capital D, but small D, Steve? Uh, no, because I think, look, regardless of your party, the governor has a responsibility to sell their agenda to the people of the Commonwealth and to the legislature. And, and there's always been a healthy tension between um, uh, the governor's office and the legislature, regardless of the party of, of either. And, uh, you know, we saw it during Deval Patrick's 
um, uh, administration. There was constantly, uh, they were at loggerheads, but oh, they got true. a lot of really great things done. Um, it happened during uh, Dukakis. I mean, Dukakis was primaried by a, a Democrat and lost the office and came back. I mean, so there's there's always that tension. This is really about leadership and not partisanship. But when, Steve, when the Steve, there over. were three felonious Democratic speakers in a row. And yeah. my thesis is that wouldn't have happened had there been more balance in state government, whether within the legislature itself. Is that not a fair conclusion to reach? So, uh, look, I have said many times and to the consternation of many of my Democratic friends that probably the best thing for little d democracy and the big d Democratic Party would be a stronger Republican Party in Massachusetts. Uh, but right now, they can't seem to get out of their own way, whether they're supporting uh, uh, Donald Trump and, and, by the way, like handcuffing their own party from uh, any progress in, in organizing uh, because of that uh, fealty to um, that wannabe autocrat that was Donald Trump. So it's, uh, I, I, you know, I wish there was a stronger debate and Jen and I have these conversations all the time. Like it would be wonderful if there were more people who were willing to talk yeah. about how we can move the Commonwealth forward, but, um, but it just doesn't exist right now. And in the vacuum of that, um, and if a Democrat wins in November, God willing, um, uh, then we're going to have that discussion about what the future of the Commonwealth lays, but it'll be up to the governor to sell their agenda. History does not show our legislature willing to step aside or abdicate any of that responsibility. They're Janet, step up. how much do you one p worry about one party? Not how much do you worry, how much should voters worry, if at all, about one party rule in Massachusetts? Steve's right about the Val Patrick's governorship. It wasn't a walkover for him and this legislature. In some ways, I got the sense they resented the fact that the spotlight was redirected to the Democratic governor and away from the speaker and the Senate president. So how much concern would you have about an all Democratic uh, governing body in Massachusetts? I have a lot of concern about it because going back to your point of small d democracy, the most important thing I think for all of us should be democracy, making sure that the that we have a balance of power, making sure that the best people are elected to office. Now, I don't agree that it's the mass, I don't agree that mass Republicans are in disarray. The Massachusetts Republican Party, I have a lot of things to say, but I can't say them on air because they're not appropriate. Um, so, you know, but I, what I will say is, that we need to separate that apparatus from the actual voters. And I also would like to point out that 57% of voters in Massachusetts actually consider themselves unenrolled. So if those voters right. actually true. wanted to have themselves vote all the time for Democrats, if they wanted Democrats in office all the time, they would be Democrats, because clearly that's you know where the cool well, kids are. You know, right? Jen, if I may, just one second. So, Jen, you, when you yeah. say that the Republican Party itself, the members are not in disarray, the reason they're not dis in disarray is because there aren't any members of the Republican Party. I mean, let me run some statistics by you. 10% of registered voters, 10% are Republicans, only 31 out of uh, 200 seats in the legislature held by Republicans. And the guy who's the chair of the Republican Party doesn't condemn uh, homophobia, endorses an anti-Asian candidate, has uh, a financial, I don't mean personal, but organizational financial problems, and trashes the most popular Republican governor in America. So the future of Republicans intrastate is miserable, is it not? No, because I don't think that, because I think if you look at the candidates that we do have out right now, if you look at Anthony Amore, who is, who's running for auditor, he is very strong, very smart, and he is very professional. If you look at Chris Dowdy, who's running for governor, forget about the other people and the other things that are being said. Again, businessman, really smart fiscal acumen. I think that that's what Massachusetts really wants and likes. That's what Before our Before I get like. to Steve, you I mentioned Doty, and you didn't mention Jeff Deal, who obviously is at the moment the leading Republican candidate who chaired Trump's campaign. And I don't know if he's for Trump or against, I don't know where he is now. Here's Doty with Adam Riley on Talking Politics. Uh, listen to what he had to say. I don't remember saying that I was a moderate. I would describe myself as my own man. I don't come from a skyscraper in Boston. I come from a manufacturing background. I've been working with uh, working families my whole life. And uh, I have my own views, and my own perspectives in life. So I would say that I'm a Chris Doty Republican. Don't call me a moderate, he says, when the only Republicans that get elected to anything statewide in Massachusetts run as moderates. He's scared of the Trump wing of your party too, no? 
I don't think anyone should be scared of the Trump wing of the party, and I don't think that's it. I think that it's, you know, first-time candidate jitters getting on TV okay. and kind of stumbling over what you're saying. And, and you know, and I feel like there are always, as, as, look, you know we know that there are always those little gotcha times, and that was one of those times. Can we In talk, meantime, I, I, I got to get the guy who's laughing oh. into this. Con Why are you laughing, Steve Kerrigan? What, well, what, I mean, what? I don't know how that, that question is a gotcha question, but um, I, I would go back to your premise, Jim, that the um, only Republicans of late to get elected in, well, in my lifetime in Massachusetts for governor, have been moderate Republicans. Uh, and uh, and I, they have terrified Chris because he's got to get through their convention process. He's got to get through their primary. And they've terrified him that if he identifies as a moderate, that he's going to lose. I mean, the fact is the Republican Party, regardless of who, which one of these two gentlemen uh, become the nominee, um, the Republican Party is going to do everything they can to hold on to this. And they will throw every a dirty rag and dirty accusation against uh, whoever the Democratic nominee is. They outspent us 11 to 1 in 2014 in the last eight weeks with outside money from, from outside of Massachusetts. So they'll do anything and say anything to get elected. Uh, the most honest thing Chris Doughty could have said was that he was a moderate and that he was a Charlie Baker uh, Republican. And by the way, he would have picked up some of that 50-something percent of unenrolled voters uh, should he get past their, their primary. But he was nervous about doing that, and that's exactly why he said what he Jen, said. Jen, I want to spend a minute. Uh, we talked about the dismal state of affairs, at least my analysis, of where the Republicans are in the state. It's not just here. We have John Sununu. I wouldn't call him a moderate, but a very popular Republican governor of New Hampshire, says I'm not running for the Senate, essentially, because I don't want to be part of that lunacy. You have uh, Phil Scott, the Republican governor of Vermont, I would argue had a pretty decent shot at, uh, uh, at the seat of Patrick Leahy. He's not running. And look at these stunning numbers that were published in Politico, the Massachusetts Playbook today. This is amazing. Massachusetts-based contributions to New Hampshire GOP congressional candidates, $317,000. To Massachusetts GOP congressional candidates, a third that much, $128,000. By the way, two of the candidates running against Jake Auchincloss, who got some of that money, aren't even running anymore. So we're, this is a disaster for the Republican Party in the Northeast, is it not? So, no, because I think that now, by the way, it's Chris Sununu, not John Sununu. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris Sununu, of course. That's okay. It's a whole long thing. A lot of Sununu's. <laughs> Um, but it, I mean, look, you know, at the end of the day, you know, Governor Sununu has a young family going to Washington, D.C. might not be what he wants to do. Washington, D.C., I think we could all agree it's a mess. If you're a Democrat, you can't agree with the progressive BS that goes on on the AOC wing of, of the party. And so I think that regardless of what party you're in, Washington, D.C. is a mess for both parties. And you have to think twice about whether you want to leave your state that you love and go to D.C. and go into the swamp and deal with everyone. That's number one. Number two, I don't think that you we're sound in like Joe Biden. Number one, number two. Go ahead. That's yeah, good. It's a little except, bipartisan except I don't, thing. I don't, have, I don't have a teleprompter or notes in front but of I'm my bummed. face. But I'm bummed. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Finish <laughs> up. I'm sorry. A Republican uses a teleprompter. <laughs> You laid that you laid that up for me. You laid that up for me, Jim. And then going back to what Steve was saying, I'm not even sure that the Massachusetts Republican Party apparatus can even host a convention. They have no money. They're begging people for their um, for their fees yeah. as delegates. I'm having a personal issue with even giving them any money to be a delegate to this convention because I don't want it to go to the Mass Republican Party. And when Chris Dowdy is the nominee for the Mass for the Massachusetts Republican side, not the party, Jim Lyons and the party will do everything they can to destroy that and hand it over to the Democrats. Okay, so I got I got to hold you there. I'm those Republicans, even Republicans. Steve, uh, you know, we only have a minute left in a bipartisan way, and you do have bipartisan moments. What would I'm serious about this? What would your advice be to Republicans, both here? and throughout New England, but particularly within Massachusetts, to regain some footing in any races, legislative, statewide races, including governor? So I think you know, the people in Massachusetts, it would be the same advice I would give Democrats, which is people in Massachusetts want results. They want people with a plan. They want people with a real agenda. And they don't, um, despite the um, machinations of some, 
uh, they don't believe in being hyperpartisan. Um, in the end, that's why 57% of the state um, is unenrolled. unenrolled yeah. um, so, so come to the come to the table with real ideas and real plans, um, and I think more folks would vote for you. I mean, look, uh, I thought we did a pretty good job in 2014 campaigning against uh, the governor and the lieutenant governor, uh, but they beat us uh, by 40,000 votes. And you know, I, I I reached out to him when he said he wasn't running for a third term, and I thanked him for his service. Uh, because he, I know what it takes and what it did for him and his family uh, to serve us, and I want to thank him again here. Um, it is, uh, it is not an easy thing to do. Um, but I, I did. I agree with him on everything. Absolutely not. But I do, um, I do appreciate his willingness to serve the Commonwealth, uh, and I wish him well in what he does next. Steve Carrigan, Jennifer Nasur, it's great to see you both. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Jim. Thanks.